Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. This is the 15-minute chart of silver, and a couple of things I want to point out here. Of course, the trend lines are the first one is holding. Uh, the second one here, you can see we actually turned around before we touched back to that trend line, which is bullish. This downtrend line has been broken, and you can see that we're rising now. We're above $20, and the other important thing on this chart is these volume spikes. You can see that it goes back to the 21st on this chart, probably even further, that the significance of this volume. Now, this I pointed out before, this volume spike was actually buying volume. It ended up being capped, but it was buying volume. This is the only one here that's selling volume. Now, this large number of spikes here, this is all buying support that came in right here when this bottom was put in. And now we have this volume spike in the after hours that coincides with this new run-up that we're seeing here. So based on all of this, I'm going to have to say I don't believe that this run is over with. Um, and if this parabolic spike pattern continues, let's pull out to try to get a prediction of where that might take us. Uh, wow. <laughs> uh, it's going to have to take us very, very high if we're going to resume the parabol uh, parabolic move here. So a resumption of that parabolic trend is really going to have to take us up to 26. So in the next few days, we could get that 26 price. I'm not saying we're definitely going to get that, but the strength that's come in now after hours and uh, the change from the trend lines and the buying volume is indicating to me that the move is not yet over. So I want to look at this SRS Rocco article. He does a fantastic job in all the stuff that he does. And it's just great analysis. Uh, this one here is something that I've talked about. It's something that Bix Weir has talked about. If you remember going back, Bix Weir was the one who pointed out that Originally, the U.S. Silver Eagle program was required to source domestic silver production for the Silver Eagles. Now, we hit that magic 50 million mark when we crossed 50 million ounces being mined, which was going down, and 50 million ounces of Silver Eagles, which was going up. And we know the story, Jack Lou and the administration changed the rules uh, that stated that Silver Eagle production had to source domestic supply. And you'll see when we uh, look at the facts in this article that it's gone way, way beyond that point, which we, it wasn't too long ago when we crossed that. And now it's moving in a very, very rapid way towards uh, the other direction of the U.S. and Canada be becoming very large importers of silver. Uh, so let's read this, and I'm going to comment on it. And this is, Americans face first real silver shortages as the investment deficit surges. At some point, an onslaught of traders moving into silver will totally overwhelm the bullion banks, and we will finally see the commercial bank short squeeze from hell. This will come as the silver price skyrockets, thus making it even harder for investors to acquire physical metal, triggering real silver shortages. Americans and Canadians will likely face silver shortages in the future as investment demand continues to surge higher. This will come as the silver price skyrockets, thus making it even harder for investors to acquire physical metal. U.S. and Royal Canadian Mints produce most of the official silver coins in the world. In 2015, the combined total of silver eagles and silver maple sales equaled 81.3 million ounces. This is a stunning amount as their total sales in 2001 was only 9.2 million ounces. And here's the chart of that. This chart was first published in my The Silver Chart Report. It was one of the 48 charts in the 
report on five sections of the global silver market and industry. As the price of silver skyrockets during the next global financial collapse, the silver market will become one of the world's most explosive markets in the future. The silver chart report is a must read, and he's plugging his stuff there. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, he does great work, and he should get paid for it. As the chart above shows, U.S. and Canada had to import nearly 34 million ounces of silver in 2015 just to supply the surging silver eagle and maple demand of 81.3 million ounces as their combined silver production of 47.6 million ounces fell significantly short. This was a huge change since 2001 as the U.S. and Canada had 87 million ounces of their domestic silver mining supply remaining after 9.2 million ounces went to their U.S. silver, eagle, and maple sales. Even though the U.S. and Canada had to import 34 million ounces in 2015 just to supply their official silver coin program, this is only part of the total net physical silver investment deficit. If we include total U.S. and Canadian silver bar and coin demand, the silver investment deficit is much larger. If we add the revised silver bar demand published in the 2016 World Sil Silver Survey, now including private silver bars and rounds, this would be the result. And you can see uh, these bars here, the blue and the red, this is U.S. and uh, Canada silver production, and you can see it's on the decline. Whereas this white line here, this is the U.S., uh, uh, the total U.S. and Canadian silver bar and coin demand. So quite a reversal. And what's fascinating is that the actual turning point in this reversal is right here when we had this silver top. So it kind of backfired in a way, if you think about it, the capping of the price, uh, yes, it did stop the run in silver, but it didn't uh, do what higher prices should do if they were allowed to stay high, which is increased production because we know that as prices rise, it becomes more profitable to produce things. So by capping the price in 2011 and then crashing it, what they did was they unleashed a huge silver demand. And of course, the production just kept falling. I only revised the data for 2014 to 15, which includes silver bar demand. I could not revise the data for 2001 to 2013 as there isn't enough detailed information in the world silver surveys to provide accurate figures. However, we can now see just how much more physical silver investment demand there is in the US and Canada when we include silver bar demand. If I take these figures now, including private silver bar and rounds, we can see the huge impact on domestic mine supply since 2001. And there's the huge deficit there. In 2001, the U.S. and Canada enjoyed an 86.1 million ounce domestic silver mine supply surplus when total silver bar and coin demand was deducted. However, the situation has totally reversed as U.S. and Canadian silver bar and coin demand hit rec a record 133 million ounces in 2015. Total U.S. and Canada's silver fabrication supply shortfall triples since 2001. According to the data from the 2010 World Silver Survey, total U.S. and Canadian silver fabrication demand in 2001 was 177 million ounces. Total silver fabrication demand includes industrial, jewelry, silverware, and silver bar and coin. Thus, the U.S. and Canada only had to import 80 million ounces of silver to supply all their silver needs in 2001. However, in 2015, the situation changed drastically. 2016 World Silver Survey reports that total silver fabrication demand for these two countries was a staggering 307 million ounces. Silver bar and coin demand accounted for 133 million ounces, 43% of the total. Now that U.S. and Canadian domestic silver mine supply has fallen to only 47.6 million ounces in 2015, these two countries had to import nearly 260 million ounces uh, to supply all their silver needs. This is more than three times what they had to import in 2001. And I want you to think about that. If the U.S. and Canada, which really in the past were some of the largest suppliers of silver, and that has dropped drastically, 
if the U.S. and Canada are importing that much silver, what are they trading it for? Well, we've already gone over trade deficit figures and how the U.S. doesn't make anything anymore. Canada had always been considered to be a natural resource haven, and their uh, trade deficits were supposedly mitigated by their natural resource export. But we know with the suppression of of commodities, and especially silver and gold, um, that's thrown that for a loop. So both of these countries importing 260 million ounces of silver, what are they giving for this silver? Well, if we're talking about the U.S., really the only thing they're giving is dollars. Uh, and what people can invest in is the ability to get more dollars. Now, as interest rates go negative, um, then they don't even have the ability to get more dollars. They just have the ability to park their dollars um, and get those dollars back or maybe even get less of those dollars back. Well, what does that mean? Well, at some point, and I think he's alluding to this, there's going to be a time when the world says, hey, wait a minute, we're sending you hundreds of millions of ounces of silver and you're not sending us anything but pieces of paper debt uh, this has got to end and i i think it's going to end really dramatically so uh, let's go down to the conclusion for those investors who thought we would continue to see much higher silver prices in early asian trading today or in the western markets tomorrow don't forget that bullion banks will likely defend the 50-day moving average of $20.50, and he gives you the Kitco, uh, Kitco uh, chart. The yellow dotted line represents $20.50 threshold line, trend line that I wrote about in my previous article. Watch out if silver breaks through this threshold line. While I don't pay much attention to short-term technical analysis, a lot of traders most certainly do. Once silver closes well above that 50-day moving average, I believe we will see a lot more hedge funds and big investors pile into the silver market. Well, that's going to be, of course, the paper silver market, not the real silver market. However, this is not something the bullion banks would like to see as they are holding on to a lot of underwater short contracts. So don't despair as this is just part of the game. At some point, an onslaught of traders moving into silver will totally overwhelm the bullion banks and we will finally see the commercial bank short squeeze from hell. Investors need to realize that the Chinese who are now piling into Bitcoin will likely make their way into silver. It's just a matter of time. So excellent article from SRS Rocco. He does great work. I encourage you to support him. So he is saying that $20.50 that's the big line in the sand. It's kind of interesting here that we're closing into that. That was kind of the touch point tonight. You can see we have that spike. Now, I, I talked about before the importance of the candlestick. And if we have that isolated candlestick, you can see on the daily that uh, we'll zoom in here. Let me get this off. So when we look at the daily, you can see that as we begin to approach this candlestick here, uh, we're starting to fill in the areas of it. So if we can go up and touch maybe 2075 or something like that, then that type of candlestick spike reversal is going to be negated. So there are a lot of things pointing to higher prices here. As I pointed out before, this area is presenting a lot less resistance than I thought it would. Now, we have to remember that we can't go by traditional uh, resistance, support and resistance analysis because uh, it, that, that comes from stocks and uh, it's based on people who had bought at a much higher price waiting to get out how many real silver stackers do we have that stacked at 22 that includes me how many stacked at 26 28 even 30 uh, how many are going to start dumping silver when it gets to 22 are they going to dump when it gets to 24 are you going to sell your silver when it gets to 26 
What about 32? Are you going to dump some when it gets to 50? Are you actually going to sell your physical silver when it's $50 an ounce? I'm not. I don't think many of you are going to. I think a lot of people are looking for maybe $500 or $1,000. Maybe they'll sell a little bit, pay off some debts, but I don't think too many people are thinking about selling at 26 or between here and 26. So uh, traditional support and resistance analysis doesn't hold up too well when you're talking about uh, a market that is uh, futures driven but is now becoming more physical. Uh, I think that the term that we use in markets is uh, strong hands and weak hands. Strong hands are people who believe in the investment and it's very hard to shake them out of their position they intend to hold for a very long time. Weak hands are people who can be shaken out by price movements. Uh, I would say that a very, very large percentage of the people holding physical silver can be described as strong hands. So let's jump over to compare silver prices. And I just wanted to take a look at how the percentages are breaking down with this price rise. Um, we can see that there are some that are really good prices here. We're talking about the bars here, the 100 ounce silver bars. You can see just a 3% premium over spot for uh, the 10 and 100 ounce silver bars. That's really good. But you can see the best price on the Eagles is still all the way up at 12%. That's pretty big premium. You can see you're paying 23 bucks for a Silver Eagle right now. Uh, that, that's not high historically, but it's still pretty high. But the big premium that I care about more than anything else is the premium on the 90% silver bag. Because I, as I pointed out in my uh, Silver Cycle video, which I'm still waiting for Jim Willie to give me credit for, uh, in the silver cycle video, I talked about how the silver cycle is broken when we have a sustained premium on the junk because, uh, just to summarize that video, what happens is when people come and sell their junk at the coin store, the coin store looks at the spot price and gives them a quote based on the spot price. And the reason why is that the coin store just piles all that junk up and then sends it off to the refinery. But when you have a premium on junk silver, when it's quite a bit above spot, then that uh, coin store is going to have to pay a little bit more for it, but also they're going to get quite a bit more for it if they turn around and sell it rather than scrap it. So what that does is that makes the situation that SRS Rocco is talking about much worse because there is less silver being recycled coming in. Uh, we have that billion ounces available every year, but only 800 million of that is mined. The 200 million difference is either uh, scrap or some other figure they come up with. That's obviously going to decrease. So everything is going the wrong way for them. And uh, how's it going to shake out? Is it going to be a blowout? It very well could be. Uh, the move to $26 now is something that I'm becoming fairly confident in. I think it's going to happen fairly soon, and we'll talk to you next time.